like to thank the folks at HP for giving uh, me an opportunity to talk to the Tech Forum audience for, uh, for a few minutes today. One of the great things about working with HP is that we have a shared vision or a common vision for the change and the opportunity that lies ahead in this next era of computing. HP and VMware have had a long history working together, and in fact, we've worked together for eight years. And a lot has happened in those eight years. HP now has 40% market share of the x86 market, 56% share of the Blade servers, and just a tremendous um, partner of VMware's in really driving innovation and driving opportunity in the data center. VMware, uh, eight years ago, we only had a couple of hundred employees. Today, we have 8,000 employees. In this year alone, in 2010, we've hired 1,300 employees to the VMware family. 100% of the Fortune 100 use VMware technology. 84% of the virtualized workloads of the world run on VMware. And we have over 170,000 customers worldwide. And many, many of those customers are our joint customers with HP. So it's a great relationship that we share and we work together on. Now some of the words that each company uses may be different and some of the descriptors as far as how we describe things and where we see things going. But from a pure substance and, and direction of where we see the, this next era playing out, um, both HP and VMware are aligned. So when we talk about this next era of computing, if you think about it, you know, we've been through a few paradigm shifts and we're really on the verge of the next one. Um, starting back to the mainframe, moving over to client server, uh, onto the web, and then onto this cloud era. Now, some people might not necessarily like that particular descriptor or that moniker. Uh, for example, if any of you have seen Larry Ellison's YouTube video about cloud computing, uh, Larry is asked a question about what do you think about cloud computing and he goes on a five minute tirade that the cloud is nothing more than sending SQL over the internet and what the heck is all this big hubbub about cloud. So regardless of the particular term, there is a change afoot. In fact, a year ago, if we talked to many of you about cloud computing, uh, you would have said, oh, it's hype, I don't know what it is, what in the world does this mean, etc., etc." And Gartner did a uh, survey in January of 2009, and it came out that uh, cloud computing was number 14 on the CIO priority list. And all of you know that if it's anything beyond number five, it might as well be priority number 140 because it's not gonna get any attention. And so in January 2010, they did the same study, and it turned out that cloud computing was number two on the priority list. Now, I was in Europe this, this January, where after that report came out, and I was hosting a CIO dinner in the United Kingdom. And I asked the, the group of folks I was talking to, I said, you know, why the movement? How in the world can cloud computing move from number 14 to number two on your priority list in just one year's time? You know, what happened? What was the driver to tell me? And so there was uh, a particularly uh, stereotypical gentleman from, uh, from the UK. Uh, he was an elderly gentleman, been around the block, a little bit cynical. And when I asked the question, you know, he leaned forward and he said, son, I'll tell you. And I was like, oh, okay, tell me. And he says, you need to understand that I am the master of my domain. I rule I all IT. Nothing happens in my shop without me knowing about it. If the line of business tries to buy a server, I prevent it from happening outside of my control. If they try to do something like rogue IT, it doesn't happen. I am the master of my domain. And yet this cloud computing thing has enabled people to bypass my controls. And he said, it's just like in the 80s when those dang PCs came out and undermined my abilities. And I spent the last 20 years trying to get control of the world. And so this cloud thing is now a, a competitive challenge or a threat to what IT means. And so I asked him, I said, so, so what are you going to do? And in this particular case, what he's done is he's taken all of the user interface, if you will, for provisioning at Amazon and given that to all of his IT employees. 
and said that this is what our constituents want. If they want to have this level of access or interface or service level when responding to IT, we're going to do that. We're going to take our IT resources and build a private cloud. Now, I asked him just for um, my own education. I said, so what about the public cloud? You know, there's a, there's a world view out there that says someday none of us will have servers. There'll just be three Uber clouds and all be handled up there and life will be fine. And uh, he said a few expletives and scoffed and said, you know, no way. There's always going to be a certain amount of uh, IP and assets that we're going to own internally. And someday I can imagine moving some resources, some workload to the public cloud. But for now, there's a lot of concerns around security and privacy and data and all of that means. And, and essentially, his focus was focused on this private cloud. And throughout this year, as I've traveled around and talked to a variety of CIOs, I hear that as a common theme. Folks are saying, what are we going to do to really deliver IT as a service, to transform our resources and our, our uh, interaction with our constituents to be more, quote unquote, cloud-like? Now, if you, regardless of the term, you don't want to call it cloud or IT as a service or what have you, the, let's talk about just the definition as far as what is this. And so it's much, much more than sending SQL over the internet. In, in fact, you know, some of the three key pillars we see in, in this cloud computing has to do first through how do you get more efficiency through the utilization and automation of your assets? How can you take your collection of, of compute power and pool it together as one resource that then provides a set of service to your organization? How can you de de develop and deliver a zero-touch infrastructure? VMware has a data center in Wenatchee, Washington, and it's in eastern Washington, and we have 200,000 square feet of, uh, of data center space. And it turns out that my uncle is on the Chamber of Commerce and lives in Wenatchee, Washington. And so when he heard that VMware was building this, um, this data center, uh, he called me and was like, oh, this is incredible, way to bring jobs back to the hometown, this is amazing, it's, you know, with 200,000 square feet, you can probably fit thousands of employees there, this is going to be a boon for Wenatchee, Washington. And uh, clearly Uncle Steve didn't understand that, you know, in our data center, uh, we actually have eight full-time employees in the 200,000 square feet managing these thousands of servers because we've been building this private cloud or the zero-touch infrastructure. Another key aspect of cloud computing is how do we provide a self-service? How can you empower your users to be able to provision resources, provision workloads, access applications, choose from a catalog to particularly uh, define what, what services they need, and yet maintain the control and the governance that you and IT require? And then finally, to echo what Tom said, we absolutely believe that it has to be open and interoperable. Today, many of the public cloud providers actually provide, if you will, a, a Hotel California experience in that you can check things into the workload into their particular service, but you can never get them out. VMware, uh, our strategy is we want to uh, be, if you will, a provider of technology or solutions to the thousands of cloud hosters or service providers in the marketplace. Today, we have 2,500 what we call vCloud providers. And these are cloud providers that have a cloud hosting and a, and a set of services built on our infrastructure with a common framework around our Spring application Java um, framework. And that will enable people to build a private cloud and a public cloud and then seamlessly move workloads from one to the other. Another exciting thing we just announced in the last few weeks is an arrangement with uh, Salesforce.com that they'll be taking their VM or their Force uh, .com platform and building that on the VMware and Spring infrastructure and calling it VM Force. And then finally, we announced that the Google Cloud is actually going to be building their application um, cloud with the Spring framework as well. So uh, our strategy is how can we provide an open environment so that no matter which particular provider you choose, you'll be able to easily and seamlessly move workloads back and forth. And I think most importantly, this has got to be something you can take your existing investments and leverage them into the future.